notice that um, it tells you that it's going to be a mail folder and all you have to do is give it a name. Now I right clicked on my inbox, which means that it's going to be right in this first line under my inbox. If I would like it to be under NWA, then what I would do is I would right click on NWA, watch. So I'm gonna click on NWA, right click, right click, and say new folder. And let's say under that, I'd like to type in NJP, create a new folder called NJP. All I have to do is type that in and click OK. And so notice that now this has become a subfolder of NWA, so it's underneath it. And one of the nice things about doing that is you can just click on this little arrow and close it up, or click again and open it up and see everything beneath it. If you accidentally did that, if you say, gosh, I really didn't mean it to be under NWA, I meant it to just be under the inbox, then you can drag it up on top of the inbox, placing it back in the inbox, and now notice that it's going to be uh, in line with everything else. Okay. Uh, how many of you have had a folder? Oh, I just placed it under somebody else. Let me just put it back up here. Um, notice that these folders are always in alphabetical order. Have you noticed that? Have you ever wanted a folder to be on top that isn't the um, folder? If you could speak up a little bit, that would be great. I'm, I'm uh, pretty loud, um, <laughs> but I can do it louder. Um, if you want a folder to be at a higher level in this version, what you would need to do is you would need to trick um, Microsoft into thinking that it should go first. So notice on my very first folder, do you see how it's got an underscore in front of it? That underscore will make it rise to the top because symbols are always ahead of letters. Okay? So if there is something really important that you'd like to be at the top, um, for instance, NJP, of course, should be first. Uh, so I'm going to right click. If you don't know how to rename a folder, then you just right click on it, right? And then click on rename. Now, if I just put underscore, it may or may not, I forget what the first one was, it may or may not go ahead of it. So if I do double underscore, so two underscores, I know for sure it'll go to the top because I know that the other one had just one underscore and therefore it was followed by a letter. So notice how I was able to get the folder I wanted to be on top, which might be important to you if you're trying to keep those folders as close to the top as possible. Now, notice that I have a lot of folders, and you could be scrolling a long time to get to different folders. So this is another really nice area up here called Favorites. If there is a folder that you use a lot, you can just drag it up here into the Favorites area. Now make sure that, do you see this line that's going across between inbox and sent mail? Make sure you see the line before dropping it. But if you put it anywhere in there, you're going to get a shortcut that you can remove at any time, but it would keep all your most used folders up top. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop it. Notice before I drop it that there's a plus next to my arrow. That plus means that it's going to add a shortcut and not move the NJP folder. So notice I have it in both places. When I click on another folder, you can see down here that NJP is no longer highlighted, so it's not pointed to it. But if I click on this one, do you notice, well, I've got nothing in NJP yet because I haven't, I haven't actually placed anything in it, but it is pointing to this folder right now. If I no longer want it there, what would I do? Well, if you unmute it, I'm sure all of you would say right click, because right click is almost always the right answer. And then do you see how I can remove it from favorites? So it can be a favorite for a while and then you can take it off if you want. So that should help you with keeping folders that you use a lot up toward the top, okay? Um, I'm gonna go back up. Notice that I keep my sent items up here. And the reason I do that is because every once in a while, I'm not sure if something actually got sent or got stuck in my outbox. So it makes it really easy for me to get to it. You can also drag Outbox up here if you're going to look at your Outbox a lot to make sure, again, that whatever it was got sent properly, okay? All right, 
So those are folders. Now, what if you want to start putting things in NJP? How would you do that? Well, um, one way to do that is to select as many of these items as you want. So one way to select is to click on the top one, shift click on the bottom one. Of course, that highlights everything in between. If you don't want to highlight everything in between, you can just control click, and control click lets you be more selective. You can highlight as many as you want, and then drag them over to NJP. That's kind of a slow way to go, though, if you have perhaps 100 different email from someone who you'd like to um, put all at once over into a folder. So another way to go would be, notice that right now this is arranged by or sorted by date. What you can do is click on that area and click on from. And so now, let's say instead of NJP, let's say this was called Fidelity. So I'm going to rename this. Okay. If I now wanted to move all of these over, I could just drag the, this is called this header area up here. Notice as soon as I started dragging, you see how the, all of them got highlighted? I could just drag fidelity into fidelity. And so in one second, I could accomplish the same thing that might take me a half hour or an hour to look through my entire mailbox to do. Okay. Now, if I, that's only if I want to drag all of Fidelity over. If I want to be more selective, once again, I can control click on the ones that I don't want, and then as I drag over, only those would go over. Any questions on that? So sorting by from or arranging by from is a really handy thing. Now, what if I wanted to see all the different people that I had email from? These little headers can be collapsed by just clicking on this arrow here, right? Do you see I'm collapsing them? But I probably have about 500 of those, so that would make me sad if I had to do all 500 individually. So how would I collapse all of my groups? These are called groups that we've got here. Um, again, if you don't know how to do it, there's only one right answer, and that is to right click. So let's right click on a group and see what we have. And look at that, collapse all groups. When I've collapsed all groups, do you see how I get to quickly scroll through and see everybody that sent me a mail? Really nice, fast way to go. Now let's say I wanted to see mail that came from someone named, gosh, let's see who's at the bottom of my list, Valerie. One of the things you can do is click on any of these headers and just start typing V-A-L, and notice it goes straight to the V's. So you don't have to scroll down, you don't have to do a search, nothing like that. You just have to start typing and it'll go straight to the name that you're interested in. If you then want to see what's in there, you can just click on that arrow and you're done. Okay, so that's sorting by from, or arranging by from. We're going to go back to arranging by date. Um, and I'm hoping, I noticed searching for some reason was not working in here before, but I'm going to try again and hope that it does. I'm going to search for, and you know the search routine is just to come up here in this search box and start typing. So I'm going to type in somebody's name that I know is in here, and I hope it finds it. I'm not sure why it's not finding anything today. Okay. Well, let me tell you what I wanted to teach you. I'm not quite sure. I've got two versions of Outlook on here, both 2010 and 2013. I'm not sure if that's why this feature is not working. But let me see if I can make it work in 2013, just because it's exactly the same um, as far as how it functions. And I would really love for you to see it actually working as opposed to not. Okay, so let's try this again. Okay, perfect. All right, do you see what I searched for was Gordon? And all I did was I clicked in this dialog box and typed in the name. But when I did that, do you, no do you notice how this tip will save you so much time. So if you don't, uh, if you don't get any of the other tips, listen closely to this one. 
So notice that even though I typed in Gordon, that it has Sandy in here, it has other things in here other than those things that are from Gordon. And so it would take me, in fact, if you look down here in the bottom left, it found 250 items that matched Gordon. And I don't know about you, but I'm a really slow reader, and so for me to scan through here and try and find that email would take a long time. So the first thing I can do is instead of just typing, notice a lot of people don't notice that there is a whole tab that as soon as you click into this search box appears. And that's important to remember because if I'm just clicked out here, if I'm not in the search tab, then do you see how it goes away? Okay, so you have to click in the search box first and then this whole search tab appears and instead of just typing in Gordon, I'm gonna click on from. And notice that I've got the from here and sender name. So now if I type in Gordon, notice that it only has those emails from him. Already dropping the total from 250, if you look in the bottom left hand corner, to 166. That's a whole lot of email I don't need to look through. Now, let's say the cool thing about this is not just the from, but the fact that each of these can add to my narrowing of my search. So if I now click on has attachments, notice that I went from, what was it, 150 a second ago? So we started at 250 something, went to 150 something, now we're at 20. Now, if in addition I knew that somewhere in the subject he was talking about something dealing with cyber, I can, type, I can click on subject, type in, start typing in cyber, and now I've narrowed it to one. So from 250 to 150 to 20 to one. I guarantee there's no way you could have read all of those that quickly, scanned through them to find the one you wanted. So using this search tools toolbar will save you hours a week in searching for things. So here are some of the things. They put the most used things up top, but if you click on the more, there's tons of different things that you can um, narrow your search with. So notice it says refine. Refine is another word for narrowing your search. Now the opposite is true at times as well. Sometimes you're going to search for something and you're not going to find it. And that's when scope helps you. Scope allows you, if you want, to increase what you're searching. So for instance, you saw I have a ton of subfolders here. If I want, I can click on all mailboxes and instead of just looking at the one that I'm currently in, it would look through all of these, okay? Your choice is all mailboxes, which is the box, current folder, which is the default, that's or current mailbox, okay? Current folder, subfolders, which means, remember when I put NW, NJP under NWA, it'd just be those things under the folder that you're currently on or all Outlook items. Now, all Outlook items would find the name Gordon even if he was in my contacts, if he was in my tasks, whatever. Effectively can increase your scope, and this is effective at narrowing down your search. Both really, really handy, and both only visible when you click up here in the search bar, okay? Um, if you search for the same things over and over, notice you can click on recent searches and it will give you some of those recent searches. So if you're always looking for Gordon with attachments or whatever, you don't have to keep redefining them all the time. You can just go to recent searches. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, one of the neat things, let's say you do use recent searches a lot or you would like to use all mailboxes a lot. Uh, one of the tools that a lot of people overlook is this tool here called the Quick Access Toolbar, okay? Now, if you're saying, but Sandy, I don't see anything like that. Oh, by the way, maybe I should get out of this view and go back to 2010 so that it's more familiar to you. Let me go back to that. Uh -huh. The quick access 
this toolbar for you is probably at the very top of your screen. It's probably over here in the top left. Notice that mine is below this area here. This area is called the ribbon, okay? If you, the, the purpose of the quick access toolbar is to um, have the tools you use most always available to you, okay? So that no matter what tab you click on, these tools will always be there, okay? So wouldn't it be nice if the tools you use the most were closer to your document as opposed to further away. If you wanted to move this quick access toolbar, and you're probably only seeing two or three tools up here right now, if you want to move it down here, how would you do that? Well, once again, if you don't know how to do something, you're going to right click on it. So if I right click on it, notice mine says show the quick access toolbar above the ribbon because it's below the ribbon. Once I click on that, it's going to show you the quick access toolbar up here, which is where you probably have it. If you would like to move it below, all you have to do is right click on it and say move it below the ribbon. So the reason I was showing this to you is that if you have a search tool that you use a lot, and in order to see it, I have to click back in this box. Let's say you really you love this from one but you don't always want to have to come up here, you'd like it to be right here, how would I move this From tool down to the Quick Access Toolbar? Well, once again, if you don't know how to do that, you're going to try and go to that item, right-click on it, and look at that. The very top thing is Add to Quick Access Toolbar. So now you have that From tool right here. Anytime you want to use it, well, you have to be in the search dialog box to use it, but once you're in there, it's right at your fingertips. Okay? If you decide, oh, I really am not going to use that that much, to remove it from the Quick Access Toolbar, you're going to right-click and remove from Quick Access Toolbar. That's how easy it is to put things on and off. And by the way, you have a quick access toolbar in Word, in Excel, in every single Microsoft application, and it works the same way, and I would highly, highly, highly recommend using it. Okay, any questions on anything we've covered so far? No? Okay. All right. Have you ever had a time where somebody calls you and starts talking about an old email that they sent you. And when that happens, and they say, hey, can you look at the one with this attachment? Now, when that happened to me before this version, what I would do is I would click on date, and I would come down to from so that all of their email was grouped together, as you saw earlier, right? You saw that's how you can group all email from one person together. The difficulty with that or the inefficiency in doing that is that usually as soon as that person hung up, I would go back to grouping by date because I want to see the incoming items, right? You don't need to do that anymore. Now there's an, a, um, another part here. Let me move this over a little bit here. Whoa. Okay. There's a new part to your screen. If you've got, if you're viewing your, um, your email over here on the right, down here at the very bottom, this is called the People pane. And notice at the right-hand side of the People pane, there's a little up arrow. And notice when I point to the up arrow, it even says People pane. So if I click on this up arrow, do you see how it's going to, and, and I click on this little mail icon right here, it's going to show me, well, Again, I think it's having the same problem as it had before because I've got the two versions, but it would show me every single email that this person ever sent me. And if I click on the one below that, it would show me only those emails with attachments that that person sent me. So I love using this for displaying email and that sort of thing so I can leave this alone and see all the email. And by the way, every single piece of email in here will be a hyperlink to the email, so if I click on it, it'll open up that email, okay? Now you can either click on this up or down arrow to open or close, or you can also drag this line up or down if you want to open it a little different height than you did before. Whatever you leave it at here 
will be what it will stay at when you open and close using the arrow if you want to use that. Any questions so far? Okay. One of the new things that they introduced in 2010 also was something called conversation view. Have you heard of conversations before? So right now, remember, this is grouped by date. And so if I click on this down arrow, do you see how if I am grouped by date, one of the things I can do is say show in conversations. What that does, and it, by the way, it then asks, and do you want to see that in all folders or just this folder? I would suggest starting out with just one folder at a time, though it's really easy to change back. But now what happens is, um, see if I can come back up here. Uh, what happens is any time a conversation goes back and forth, and what I mean by a conversation is, let's say I send you an email saying, would you like a class? And you send me back one saying, sure, when would you like to schedule it? And I send you one in return saying, how about Thursday? That would all be considered one conversation. And the reason Microsoft would consider it one conversation is because you're replying and the subject is the same, okay? So what it does then is it gathers all of those and it puts them together under the one email and you know there's a conversation when you see an arrow. And if you click on that arrow, it'll open up the conversation. And notice that it's not just showing you things that are in the inbox, but do you see here is what I sent to her, then what she sent back to me, then what I sent to her. So all of those are grouped together, which is really nice, okay, when you want to see the span of the conversation. Not only does it allow you to see things grouped together, but another really nice feature of having things in conversation groupings is this cleanup tool. In what I described, you going back and forth like that, saying, when would you like the class? You know that in general, the entire scope of that email is embedded in that final email, right? If you were to scroll down the email, you would see every single back and forth you had. So you may have 10 email on basically one conversation. Under cleanup, if you say cleanup conversation, it will delete all prior email that is embedded in that final email. So what a nice way to clean up what most people have, which is overstuffed inboxes, okay? Now, you have three choices here. Clean up conversation, which means just the one I'm currently on, it will delete everything except the one that's the final one um, or any that aren't completely in embedded in another one. Clean up folder, which means it would go to every single conversation in the folder. And clean up folder and all subfolders, which means that it would clean up many folders if there are subfolders. My recommendation, I'm a very safety conscious person and I hate thinking that something got deleted without me knowing it and, and without me thinking that it's doing the right thing. So if I were you, I would stick to clean up conversation and, tell, and use it for a week or two until you're satisfied that it's doing exactly what you want it to do, and then perhaps try one of these others. Personally, I stick to just clean up conversation, but if you are gonna ever clean up folder, and let's say it's your inbox folder, what I would do as a precaution is I would go to my deleted items, right click on deleted items and empty the folder. Now your deleted items is empty. Everything that it cleans up is going to go to deleted items. So then if there's anything you say, oh, I wish I hadn't deleted it, you know that everything in deleted items came from your inbox and you might want to replace it. So that would be a really nice way to make sure that everything is going to work the way you want it to. Okay, so it's clean up conversation. Ignore conversation. That's a dangerous one. What ignore conversation is, is it says, do you want me to um, delete all future email 
about this same topic, not just the ones that have come in already, but future. So think about that. If something your manager sent you, if you ignore it, that probably would not be wise. However, I do love this tool for things like when somebody sends an email out saying, I've got two tickets to the Mariners game, who would like to go tonight? Well, everybody in the office seems to have the need to reply all instead of just reply, so I get all this garbage mail that I am so totally not interested in. For that type of thing, I love ignore, so I don't get any more of that stuff. So these are all really handy things for saving you time, okay? Any questions on that? Okay. How many of you do multiple things with one email? And what I mean by that is um, maybe you want to read an email. Uh, a certain email needs to not only go to you but to your manager and to someone else. There, there might be many different steps that you take with a particular email. And that's what Quick Steps, if you look here in the center, this is a new feature that was added in this release. And they give you some examples of some Quick Steps here. But let's look at what a Quick Step does. I'm going to click on To Manager. And notice this is says First Time Setup because I've never done it before. Okay. So what it wants to know is, what are all the different things you would like to do when I click on one or more email? So do I want to, so first of all, what is the name? Well, to manager, it could be to manager or it could be to, let's say, to Sue Enterman. Okay, so then here I would click on forward and I would find Sue. Double click on Sue, and it doesn't just have to be Sue. Maybe I want to send it to four people. Whatever it is that you want, you can do that in here, okay? And so that would just do one particular step, right? All it's going to do, you click on an email, I'm going to click on to manager, and it would send it to Sue without me having to do a forward and type in her name and that sort of thing. But if I click on options in the lower left-hand corner, notice I can add more action. So if I add another action, I could say, okay, after you forward it to Sue, oh, my Sue went away. Take this one out. Okay. So after I forward it to Sue, what else would I like to do? I can click on the down arrow. Maybe I'm going to move it to a Sue folder. Okay, I'd have to create one over here, but I could do that. I'm going to, let's say I move to folder means it's going to be taken out of my inbox, right? So I can either move it or I can copy it, or maybe once I forward it on, I, need, I don't need it any longer, I can de delete it. All of these different choices, okay? So I'm just going to say move to folder and then it'll allow me to choose the folder. So since she works for NJP, I'll choose the NJP folder, okay? I can add another action. Once I move it to that folder, maybe I want to categorize it. Whatever it is, it allows you to do multiple actions if you want. And so when you're done, I'm going to go ahead and click on Save. When you're done, I can just click on whichever item I would like and click on to Sue Enterman and it should forward it to her. She's going to, do you see how it did a forward right there? So I could type whatever message I want, okay? And then it will move it to the NJP folder. So Quick Steps is really a nice feature when you want to control what happens to the email. So it's not the same as creating a rule which happens automatically when it enters your inbox. This you're allowed to select, which I like better because what if Sue just sends me an email saying, hey, how about lunch? Do I want to forward it to somebody and do I want to put it in a separate folder? I don't. So this gives me the chance to look at an email and then decide what I want to do with it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
All right. So before we leave email, because we have other things to do with uh, um, contacts and that sort of thing, one of the things that a lot of people haven't heard of before is something called um, auto-create. What auto-create means is let's say somebody sends you an email, like this person. By the way, before I, get out, uh, before I continue with this, I'm going to get out of conversation view. So I just take the check off and I say I want this to go back to normal. Okay, so I've got Jan and I, let's say I say, gosh, you know, I would really love to have her as a contact because I'm going to be emailing her in the future. What so many people do is they'll click on contacts and they'll start typing in all that information, which is a huge waste of time. When all you have to do is drag her email on top of contacts, let go, and it will automatically open up a contact screen with her name and her email address in there. It also embeds the entire email in here, which you probably don't need, right? But it also embedded her signature block. So if I want more information than just her name and her email address, I can just drag across her job title and drag it up to job title. I can drag across where she works and drag it over to company name. Same with cell. Drag it over to mobile. And I can do all of these different things. Um, I don't see an address, unfortunately. doesn't look like she gave me your address, but if so, I would just drag it over to address. Then I would come over here, highlight it, press delete, and save and close. Now, actually, I'm kind of lying because before I'd save and close, I like categorizing my uh, contacts. And categories allow you to, if I wanted to see everybody who is a, who I want to send holiday cards to, I can do that if I give them a category of holiday cards. If I want to see all my business law clients, I can do that if I give them a category of business law clients. So we'll look at that in a second. But all I would have to do here is save and close, and I would have a new contact with no typos and with within seconds of when I drag them over into contacts. Now contacts isn't the only folder you can drag into. If Jan wants me to do something, I can drag this onto tasks and it will automatically create a task for me. Now you may want to change the subject a little bit to being more clear because it would be the subject of the email, okay? But whatever it is that you'd like to type in, you can give it a start date, a due date. You can even assign the task to somebody else if you don't want to do it yourself. But that's how easy it could be. Okay? Or if you want to make a date with this person, you could drag her down to calendar. And it will automatically create a calendar item for you. So anytime you drag from one folder to another, it will automatically create a new item of that type. Any questions on that? Okay. okay. Any other questions or about email at all? There, there was a question here in the chat, which is, okay. um, in case it's not covered later, when I try to print a PDF with a long string of emails, a conversation, the formatting gets weird. It creates a bunch of extra lines and spaces, turning five pages of email into 15. Do you have any tips there? They are printing attached PDFs. The PDFs have extra spaces or the message the messages have extra spaces. When they when they take the string of emails and um, turn it into a PDF to print, it gets really, really large. So it's the emails, not attachments. They're trying oh, to print okay. a whole conversation of them. Okay. Uh no, I don't really have any. Um, I guess my only tip on that, which I, I, do, I don't have the answer to that question. I'd have to, I'd have to look into it. Um, I will say, though, so let's say you are trying to um, print these emails, um, 
and let's get one with an attachment. Here we go. Notice this one has an attachment here. So if I want to print these emails, what a lot of people think is that if you're printing an email with attachments, that what you have to do is you have to go into each attachment and print them separately, or at least print each email separately with attachments. And what I wanted you to know is if you go to File Print, um, under the Print Options, do you see that under Print Options there's this Print Attached Files? So you don't have to uh, do one at a time or, or even turn it into PDFs or whatever. If you just click on Print Attached Files, it will do, it'll print all of the uh, email and the attached files, okay? And a lot of people don't know that that's there. Um, and then there was another question here, which is, um, I used to be able to assign colors emails from the ED or COO, et cetera, I don't see this function anymore. Is it still available? Um, Categorize. Ah, okay. Yes. Absolutely. You can assign colors. It's now, in, in the older versions of, um, of Outlook, there were two different things. There were categories and there were colors. Now they've combined categories with colors, and so you're assigning them at the same time. And so you click on Categorize, and if you want to um, add new categories or whatever, you would click on All Categories. And then this is where you can decide what category means what or what ca color gets assigned or whatever. So if you already have um, a category you like but you don't like the color uh, or you don't like the description or whatever, this is where you do it. So let's say I didn't like the color of important. I could click on important and I could just come down here and I could change the color, okay? If I didn't like the name, I could click on here, click on rename, and it would allow me to type in a new name. If I want to create an entirely new item, I can click on new and give it a name and a color. And notice that it also allows you to give it a shortcut key. So let's say the color you want to assign a lot of the time would be red or whatever it is. So maybe you assign a shortcut key of Control F2. So instead of you having to click on category, categories and give it a category each time, you could just click on the email and press Control F2. And these categories are the same throughout Outlook. So you can so you can use them for mail, but notice here these I use for tasks, personal to dos, calls, and work to dos. Those are categories I use for my tasks. Then down here, these are all categories that I use for my contacts. So all categories are in the same place, regardless of whether you use them in contacts or tasks or whatever. Does that help the person that wanted the color? Um, yeah, so thanks so much. Okay. okay, so notice that here, this this little box here, so you can either click on the item and you can go up to categories and assign it that way. You can right click on the item and go to categories and assign it that way. Now notice when you, and this is true again in contacts or here, if you just want to assign one category, you could just click on it here. In my contacts, often I want five or six categories, so then you might want to go to all categories and you can check them all. Because that first way that I showed you, what happens is once I click on one of these, this will go away and I have to right click and do it again. Each time I have to right click and come here again. So, um, and also this is generally not a complete list of all your categories, so coming to all categories is quite helpful. Okay. That also, if you're using categories a lot, you might want to right click on it and assign it to your quick access toolbar. I use it a ton when I'm in contact. All right. Uh, any other, are we done with, uh, Brian, then questions for uh, mail? Yes, we are getting a little bit of background noise, so I'm going to um, mute everyone. Sandy, you'll need to hit star six to unmute yourself. So you 
can hear me again. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just assume that I can hear you. Can hear. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. So if there aren't any other questions having to do with um, mail, then we're going to go on to calendar because that's probably the next most used. Now the person that was asking about color, uh, you probably see that color is something I use a lot in my calendar. Um, when Microsoft first came up with colors, I thought uh, just sort of fluff, and then I decided no, I really like it. Um, because not only can you assign colors, but you can actually have Microsoft Outlook color code for you. So we're going to learn both of those. Um, so for instance, like if I consider this important, then I can just come up here to categorize and click on important, which is what I did. Or again, we showed you earlier, I could right click, go to categorize and do it here. Okay. And for important things, I do do that. I, I hand color code all my important things. But things like this, um, everything that I type B colon in front of, those are all my, I have my own business, and those are all business related, and I'd like them to automatically be colored orange. Or maybe you have trial dates, and every time you type in the word trial, you would like it to turn red, okay? So, um, so one thing you can do, of course, is the categorize. But another thing you can do is you can say, you know what, I would like Outlook, every time I type a certain thing in, I would like it to color code for me, okay? To do that, think of it as you're changing the look, right? Anytime you're changing the look, you're always talking about how you're viewing it, okay? So under view, and by the way, all of this is in the handout that Brian's going to post. So you'll easily be able to see this. Under view, there's something in the very beginning called view settings. Okay, second tool from the left. And what we're talking about now is conditional formatting. Conditional formatting says, hey, if it meets a certain condition, format it. So that's what we're going to look at. Now these are my conditional formats. I've got one for children, one for birthdays, business, that sort of thing. Let's look at one that's already created. I created one called business. I gave it a name called business. You can name it anything you want. It really makes no difference. That's for you. What color do you want it? You can assign it whatever color you want. Okay. And then condition is what needs to be true in order for it to assign that color. Okay. So I'm going to click on condition. And what needs to be true is that it has to have a B colon somewhere in this uh, subject area. Okay? So why did I type B colon? Well, if I just typed B, then if I typed in lunch with Bill, it would turn it orange. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a colon but you have to think about making it something unique, okay? So for birthdays, if I look at condition, you see that it, if I type in either birthday or B-day or even anniversary, I want it to turn gray, okay? So you separate with commas all the different possibilities and then it will search for those and change it accordingly. And it gives, uh, it changes it according to the order that you have it in here. So for me, business was most important, but if I have a business thing that's also got birthday in the description, what it's asking is what color would you like it to be? And it's going to be in this order. So if I have something that's a business, which I have orange, right? And birthday, which I have gray, it's going to make it orange because business is the top of my priority list. And the way you change that is right here with the move up, move down. Okay? So how do I create one from scratch? Well, I can click on add. And this name, remember this name means nothing. It's really the condition that means something. This is just for you to remember what you put in here. 
So let's say this is what I'm going to use for trial and due dates. Okay? And for that, let's say those are pretty important to me, so I'm going to pick red. Pick any color you want. Notice that some of these are really dark. Those are really quite miserable to look at in your calendar, so I would highly recommend sticking with the more opaque, but that's completely a personal choice. Okay, so I'm going to click on this. All right. And then the condition, this is the important part. What are you going to search for to turn it red? Well, I maybe want to type in trial to turn it red and then a comma. Due for due date to turn it red. Um, what else might you want to turn red? Anything else? Maybe if you type in imp for important. I don't know. Whatever it is that you would like it to search for and turn red. I'm going to click on OK and OK again and OK again. So now anytime I type in um, trial and hit enter, okay, well, so it's too low on the totem pole, so let's uh, go back to view settings, conditional formatting. Remember I said it did it in order, so I'm going to move this up, click on OK and OK. So here we go. So there it's red. If I say report due, it's red. Okay? So it's really nice. Now, there are times that, you know, uh, you may type something in. For instance, I have one for my children, and my children, one of them's named Nick. So anytime I type in Nick, it's going to make it a certain color, right? Well, even if I type in a Nick that's not my child, it's going to turn it that color. So you either need to make sure that it's unique, or for me, I don't really care. I know if I'm going to lunch with a Nick that's not my son, I still know it's a Nick that's not my son, so I could care less. But just so you know, to make it as unique as possible, okay? I'm going to go back into my view settings, conditional formatting, take away my trial due, click on OK. And OK again. Does anybody have any questions on automatic formatting? Again, it's completely in my handout. No? One of the new things in this version was that they started putting tasks, uh, if you want to see them, at the bottom, which I think is really nice. So when you're on a particular day, you, if a task does have a due date, you'll be able to see the due date, uh, the, the tasks on those days. Okay, um, so searching. One of the things that I would highly encourage you to do is to be consistent in how you type in your calendar items. What I mean by that is, so every time I'm doing a training for NTAP, notice I typed in NTAP like this. And so if I wanted, to, if I said to myself, gosh, I don't remember when I'm doing NTAP trainings this year, I can go up to the search box up here, type in NTAP, and I can find all of them immediately, assuming my find were working in this version, but it would find them all immediately and list them here. So if I wanted to delete them all or just see what they all were or change them all, it makes it so easy to work with. Where if sometimes you call it Northwest Justice Project, project and sometimes you call it NJP and some you know if you're not consistent in how you name things you won't have that advantage of being able to use the search engine for you. Okay? All right. So what is the easiest way to type in or the fastest way to type in an appointment? Most of, hopefully you know that if you're in day or week view the neat thing is you can just highlight as much time as you want for the appointment and then just type in whatever it is you'd like and hit enter and you're done. Because what I see a lot of people do instead of that is they'll double click or they'll click on new appointment and this is a lot slower way of putting an appointment in. Okay? So all you need to do is either drag first or you can type first and then drag one of these little um, circles and make it longer. But staying in this view is a lot faster than going to the new appointment view. 
okay? Now, if I want to move this, I think a lot of people know that to move, you can just drag it, right, to wherever you want to go. But when you want to copy, how do you do that? Even right-clicking, which I told you was the answer to everything, it's not the answer here. Notice that there is no copy here. Microsoft doesn't, for some reason, give you a copy command. So what if you wanted to have training here as well? Anybody know what you'd do? Two choices. One is, instead of dragging with your left mouse button, which moves, if you drag with your right mouse button, then when you let go, you're going to have choices. Now, it looks kind of weird right now because you're seeing nothing, but if I click on copy, do you see how I have two of them? So once again, left mouse button is going to move, but dragging with your right mouse button is always going to give you choices. Now, the other thing that you should know in all applications is what key do you need to hold down when you're dragging in order to copy? This is another incredibly useful tip, not just for Outlook, but for every single Microsoft application. And that is, when you drag, if before you let go, before you let go of your mouse, if you press the control key, do you notice how all of a sudden a plus shows up next to the arrow and training shows up twice? If your control key is down when you let go of the mouse, you will automatically copy. This is such an important concept in Word, in Excel, in PowerPoint. Anytime you want to copy something, if the control key is down when you let go of your mouse after dragging, you will have copied the item. Okay? It's true even in contacts. If I've got two contacts, that work for the exact same company, wouldn't it be nice if you could just copy all the information? Just drag that contact, okay, and before letting go, hold your control key down, it'll make a copy of the contact. Now it's going to say, do you want to update information because it's seeing the same contact, so you're going to say, no, I want to add a new contact, and once you've clicked on add, it's going to allow you to type in a new name or whatever information differs. Okay. All right. So, back to calendar. Does anybody here have a busy calendar where you look at it and you go, oh my gosh. So let's say somebody calls you and says, what Tuesday this month can you meet? Well, you can tell by looking at these down arrows that you're not seeing everything that's happening those days. Every single one of these days has something else going on that I can't even see. Even if I could see it, I'd be like, well, gosh, I wonder when this 10 o'clock appointment ends. I wonder if I could actually have lunch with this person on that day, right? Well, the easiest way, normally what people do is they'll go to the, click on the down arrow, they'll go to the day. If I had to go to every single Tuesday and look at each one, what a pain, right? But what people don't know, a lot of people don't know, is this little calendar is worth its weight in gold. And if I want to see what's happening with me every Tuesday, all I have to do is hold my control key down and click on every Tuesday. And isn't that easier to be able to see which Tuesday I can have lunch than trying to go a day at a time or whatever? It, this is so handy. If you want to see, hey, what's happening 9th, 10th, and 11th, I can drag because they're next to each other. But if I also want to see the 16th, 17th, and 18th, I just need to make sure I hold my control key down because they are not sequentially next to each other. Okay? I can also look at two different weeks. If I come over to the left and click, notice I'm seeing one week. If I would like to see what that looks like next to this one, just hold your control key down and click. There are so many more views than you might think you have just by day, week, month, okay? You want to see three weeks at a time because remember when you saw the whole month of five weeks, you couldn't see half of what I was doing? 
But if I just drag across three weeks, I can see everything. Notice not one of these has a down arrow anymore. Okay? So this is a cool thing. Not just for viewing, though. What if I need to move an appointment? What if you call me and say, Sandy, I can't do it on March 17th. Could you please move it to the 25th? I can actually use this. I can drag this up here onto this little calendar and move it or copy it. Okay? So this little calendar is amazingly useful. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. So any questions on calendar? Do you ever need somebody outside of NJP or in, or not NJP, excuse me, I know a lot of you aren't NJP. Um, if you need somebody else to see your calendar, one of the neat new features that they put in this release is this email calendar. So if you click on email calendar, it'll ask you, how many days would you like to show this other person? So do you want to just show them today or seven days or 30 days or what exactly would you like? So you can, you can pick. Then what would you like them to see? Just whether you're free or busy or actually what you're free and busy with. So you can have just free busy or you can have limited or full details. Okay, and then there's more advanced things as well. But let's just look at this. I'm going to click on OK, and look what it does. It creates the neatest little calendar right inside my email. Okay, it's showing me the dates because I said seven days, right? And look at that. It's showing me what I'm doing for each of those days. Really a nice way to send somebody if you need to send or free busy or anything like that, and that is email calendar. Another neat thing is calendar groups. Do you ever need to see when certain people, especially if you're a scheduler, or maybe you just want to see who's going to be in the office today. Maybe you're a receptionist and you'd like to see everybody's calendar. This here is a calendar group. Notice it says My Calendars and it has all these underneath. So the cool thing about that is if I want to see all the calendars, I can just click on that and notice how it opens them all up. If I then decide, you know what, I don't want to see this one, I can just uncheck it. Okay? So this is a group and you can have as many different groups as you want. So if you have a group of just attorneys or a group of just check signers or whatever the group is, you can create your own calendar group this easily. You just click on calendar groups and create a new group and give it a name. So maybe you have one called office for the whole office or one called attorneys for just attorneys or one called boardrooms. If you are worried about is a boardroom schedule or not, Maybe it would be really nice to, to do one for boardrooms, assuming they have been set up as resources. Otherwise, that wouldn't work. But I'll call it whatever name I want. And then what it's going to do is it's going to notice it automatically put attorney there as my group. And then I can just double click on all the people who are attorneys in my office. Okay. Click on OK. Now, of course, this is not going to show anybody because none of these people are really in my office. But Notice that it opened up all of their calendars. And so now anytime I want to see the attorney group, I can just check it. When I don't, I can uncheck it. So instead of selecting who you want to see each time, you can just create as many of these little groups as you want. Okay? If I want to delete the group, I'm going to say yes. I just right-clicked and I deleted the group and it's gone. But that's a really nice, fast way to be able to see who's here, who's not. Okay, any other questions on calendar before we move on to contact? No? All right. Some neat things about contacts um, or tips. One of the things a lot of people do in contacts, if they have a lot of contacts and they need to get to the R's, let's say, to find my name, they might come over here and click on the R. The problem is, my last name is R-Y. So then you're going to have to scroll 
for forever before you get to my name. Instead of using this, I never use this, instead of using this, I would just click on any one of these items and just start typing RYL and boom, I'm right at Rylander. That is much faster than clicking on R and scrolling or even doing a search. Okay, again, click on any item and start typing. I started typing ALL and notice I'm right there. Okay, once I'm on an item, if I want, if I don't want to get off of my keyboard, I can just hit enter in order to see the item. Now let's say I'm in a contact and I go, oh, I, I need to go to that person's address, but I have no idea where this is. Did you ever notice there was a, just a little map it tool there? If you click on map it, it will automatically open up Bing Maps and show you where it is without you having to type anything in. And then if you want to click on directions, it'll give you directions in just seconds. You'll just have to say where you're coming from and give you all the information that you need. I think that's a very cool feature in Outlook, okay, is this little map it guy. Another thing that I really love to do, as I told you earlier, is categorize. Notice that this person is a business client of mine, okay, that's why it says be client. The more categories I add, and you can add as many categories as you want, okay, so now this person would get a holiday card, okay. If I want to remove holiday card, I can just right click on it and I can clear that, or I can clear all the categories. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close this, go back into, oh, did I close that? Looks like I closed out of Outlook entirely. Okay, go back in. Right now, the view that I'm looking at, by the way, if, if you have never changed your view, you're probably looking at a view called business card view. This is a new view in this release. This is not my favorite view because look at how much wasted space there is just so that it looks like a business card. So my preference is to be in card view. It's an older view, um, but it wastes so much less space. So I get to see so many more of my people, which is, is what I prefer, okay? Um, but. I've also created a view called by category view. So I'm going to click on that and show you. Notice that these are the categories I was telling you about earlier that I created. One is business client, one is business law client, and you may say, well, why did you put the B's in front? Well, notice how all my business things are all grouped together, and the reason they are is because I started them with the same letter. So instead of seeing business client up here and subcontractor down here and having to go through this whole list, I get to see them grouped together because of the way I named it. Okay, all personal things have a P in front of it, so all personal things are grouped together. It's totally up to you, but if you want them sorted, you have to think of that in your naming because it'll always be done alphabetically. Okay? Now, one of the things when I first started using categorize, I'm going to go back to all categories. I showed you this earlier. Whoops. I showed you earlier that um, these are the colors you have to choose from. And at first, I was upset with Microsoft that they only gave me whatever it is. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. I think it's 25, yes. 25, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 25 colors. And I ran out of 25 colors because I got more than 25 categories. And then what I realized was that I could, the colors would mean nothing to me if I assigned a new color for every category. I could never remember what 25 different colors were. So I went back and reassigned the colors and decided, hey, you know what, I'm going to keep all my business that orange color. All my personal will be the blue color, and then I've got this category for holiday cards. But I realized that they gave me really plenty of colors for how many I could remember. It's really useless to have a rainbow. It's much more useful for me to have it mean something. 
and this made it very easy for me to see my business versus my personal kinds of contacts. So just keep that in mind when you're setting up colors and that sort of thing for, for categories. Okay, um, I believe, I mean, I could keep going to tasks as well, but I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for you to ask any questions, if you have any questions on anything we've covered or anything we haven't covered. So I'm thinking this would be a good point to turn this over to you and cover any questions that you might have. And don't forget to unmute yourself because right now I'm not hearing anyone. So star six will unmute. Uh, there's a question here, can we go over calendar sharing? Well, we could, except I can't do that because I, uh, I am a standalone. But if you want to share your calendar, again, it would be sharing anything. You would right-click on it. Now, I don't know if you could right-click on this calendar or not. I, I don't recall. Let me I No, it looks like that wouldn't work. So what you would do, down here at the bottom, do you see there's a folder, which allows you to see your folder list? So I would click on the folder list and then scroll down to your calendar, okay? Right click on your actual calendar and in here there's going to be a share. Um, now, or if they're either share or properties, either way you're gonna see a share. Um, and from there, notice I don't even have a share tab, but you would. And with that tab, um, I believe, let me see if it's in my book. I think I have it in my book. But when you share it, you're going to be able to, maybe it's not in my book. Um, I'm not seeing it. But when you share, the thing is, there are going to be different uh, levels that you can share. You can say that a person could just view your calendar, okay? Um, or you can say that they can add items, but they cannot delete items. Or you can say they could edit your calendar, which would mean they could add, they could delete, they could do anything they want. Or you can give them, these are different roles. Another role is author. Author says that they'd be able to add and delete only those things that they put in. So they could delete something they put in, but not something you put in. So look at the different roles, um, and maybe, you know what, I know I do have documentation on this, even if it's not in this book. Let me just quickly check here. See if anything says sharing on here. Tell me if you see sharing. Here, set share permissions. Yay! I knew I wrote it, I just didn't know where. Okay. So, what I wanted you to see. So see there's a tab, there will be an extra tab called permissions when you're not a standalone like I am. And when I was talking to you earlier about roles, this is what I was talking to you about. So you can assign roles, and so first of all, what you would do is you would click on add here, and it would show you a list of everybody in your company. And you would double click on all the names of the people that you would like to give permissions to. And then what you would do is you would click on the name that you would like to give permissions to, and you would give them a role. You know, so uh, reviewer, which would just be to see it, um, author, those kinds of things. Now, when you give them a role, what's going to happen is you're going to see different items down here checked. So, for instance, um, an editor would be able to edit items, which means add, and delete items. You'd see both of them be all. 
if you said author, you would see these saying own, which means they could only edit or delete the items they put in themselves. So using these roles, these roles will give you a default of what it is they can do. But let's say you choose a particular role and these aren't exactly what you want. Let's say you do um, editor, but you don't want them to be able to delete. Well, what you can do is you can take a check off of a certain item. You can change these. So these are what most people use just as the default, but if you want anything custom, and you'll see this turn into custom when you do that, you can select each individual item over here on its own. And then you would just click on OK, and that would give them the ability to then open up your calendar and, um, and do whatever permissions that you told them they could have. So here's one. See, this is the name of the person. Let's go down. And here, hopefully, it'll show you, it may show you that these are the different roles, owner, publishing, editor, editor, that sort of thing, and what they allow you to do. Okay. Did that help so, answer that question? Yes. We've got a few more questions here. Um, one of okay. them is on order of contacts when I view them. Um, why do they sometimes end up out of order? I indicate how I want the name listed. Um, but it's listed another way. Good question. Um, I'm hoping that I understand what you're asking, but <clears throat> if, if what you're asking here is how, how is it being listed here, um, if you open up a contact, then, oh my goodness, look at all of those. <laughs> uh, but anyway, if you open up a contact, what you want to do is you want to look at the file as. The file as is going to determine where it is in your, um, in your listing. Okay? It's going to be sorted by file as. So um, if you click on the down arrow here, often you will have different choices like first name, last name, last name, first name. If there's a company name, that will be a choice. So look here and see. Uh, if you're talking about normally viewing, that would be what would determine the normal view. I don't know if you're talking about that or if you're talking about if I look at other views like list view, um, this may be sorted in a completely different order. In list view, if you just click on the top of any one of these, you can it'll sort by that. So if I want to sort by file as, I click on it and it'll sort by file as. If I want to sort by company, I click on that and you'll see it sorted by company. Um, so, in list view, you can, you can do that. Also, in card or business card view, if it's not sorting the way you want, I was saying how it's normally sorted, but again, under view, remember we were looking at view settings earlier? There's a sort option here. And so, if you have changed the sort option from file as ascending, do you see file as ascending is always going to be the default? But if you change the sort option, you can sort by company here or by whatever it is you want. You have many different sort options. So I don't know if that's the reason. But, um, but often it's because people don't pay attention to the file as. And a lot of times it's because names, uh, especially odd names or names like here, which I shouldn't have done. I put in both people's first name. If you click on full name, you'll see how Outlook always tries to figure out what you want as the first and the last name, it, but it doesn't always do such a great job of it. It especially doesn't, I mean, 90% of the time it does, but when you do things like, let me add a new contact, this happens a lot when you add a comma, like some people will say Sandy Rylander, comma space, and AIA, you know, some sort of, or MD, or whatever it is, some sort of thing. When you do that and you click on full name, you will see a total mess. It does not respond well at all. So if you want to do something, first of all, don't put in a comma. What I would do is type in just the name, or if you have any name you have any suspicions about, then click on, uh, well, see, it's, it's still messed up because of the way I did it. But you can fix it either here, just move 
cut and paste or do whatever you want here, but make sure, so that would be a suffix, AIA would be a suffix, um, title would be like Mr. Ms., that sort of thing, but anytime you've got something that's yielding strange results, always click on check full name, make sure these are done correctly, and then go ahead and click on OK, and then you know it's the right way, okay? So that could also be an issue. Did that help? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, we've got three more questions here. Um, one of them okay. is I would like to see my calendar in email view, but I use iCalendar, and so the calendar is blank. Could you repeat that? Uh, I'll try it one more time. I'd like to see calendar in email view, but I use iCalendar, and so the calendar is blank. Not sure I completely get that question myself. I don't either. I'm sorry, okay. I can't answer it because I don't know what exactly okay. what's happening. If that person wants to try to clarify, please do that. We'll move on to the next one. Um, can you okay. <laughs> journal function? What, what function? Journal function? Oh, what what's the question? Does she uh, just want to know where it is or and what it is, yeah. Okay. Or what it's for. So um if you go, if you're asking where it went, um since it's not I, I it's not my preference to use that. Um and uh, apparently Microsoft doesn't think so either because they hide that tool. But if you click on the down arrow, let's, I, you must have been used to using it or something. Uh, if you click on the down arrow here and you see add or remove buttons, you'll see there's a journal button that's deselected that you can click on. And then you have that option of clicking on journal. And what it says is journal can automatically track office documents and email messages associated with contact um, if you want it to. The problem is that'll just really increase the size of your mailbox because it's it's keeping all that information, which is um, something I think your tech support department should probably decide whether they want you to be using it or not using it or whatever. Um, but so, uh, so here it says it can track those things if you want, but the activities page in a contact also tracks it. So when you go to your contacts, if you look at the activities page, you'll be able to see that. And it's asking you, do you want to turn journaling on? Um, so you can, I don't, so I'm going to say no, but you could say yes there if you wanted to. And it would show you different journaled items. Um, you can also, though, say no, and you can add journal entries yourself if you want to. Um, and the thing that I am not, that I don't like so much about journaled items is that um, if somebody calls you and you want to quickly look through journaled items, there is no such thing as quickly looking through them. You have to open them and close them, open them and close them. If you want to print them, same thing. You have to print them one at a time. I much prefer using, instead of using journal, um, I much prefer in the contact area, if you open them up, there is a notes area and I much prefer using this for my journal entries. Um, you can type in a date time at, at the beginning of each entry. Always make sure that you go to the top and type in new entries. And that way, when somebody calls you and wants to talk to you about something, you can just quickly read down all of them. You can print them all at once. You always have the most current at the top. To me, that's much more effective than the journal feature. It's just not used very much. It's sort of a leftover from older versions. So the next question we've got on here is how do you import and export contact groups? You don't. No, I'm just kidding. Um, actually, uh, that is a really good question. Uh, contact groups or, con or categories? Um, I'm not quite sure, but if you're trying to import a lot of times people will create lists in Excel and then at some point they realize that wasn't the wise thing to do, that they should have put them in Outlook to begin with. And so um, whether it's Excel or Word, any table you can import if you go to File. And if I remember correctly, yeah, File Open, they always put it in different places on all the releases. But File Open and then Import. 
And notice it says import from another program or file. So um, it really depends where you're importing from. I, I don't really know what this person's doing, but if it's from another program, you can just click on Next. And then notice it's going to give you Excel as an uh, option from another Outlook PST, from comma separated values. Then you would just click on Next once you pick that, and then browse to the file. Um, Notice then it'll ask you, do you want to replace duplicates, allow duplicates, do not import duplicates. If I were you, this feature scares me to some extent. I mean, I, I'm such a safety person that what I do, and I do import contacts quite a bit for, for clients, I would right click on contacts and remember that you can create a new folder. And I would just call the new folder import, let's say. And then what I would do is I would import into that import folder, and I would double click on an item to make sure everything imported correctly because, let me go back to what I was talking about a second ago. So I went to file open, went to import, import from another file, uh, let's say comma separated values. Now I'm not sure if it's going to let me go to the next one without having a file to open, and I don't know if I have any files to open, but let me try. I don't really have anything. But what's going to happen next? After we get, if I found something and I clicked on next, what would happen next it is it would say, would you like me to go ahead and import or would you like me to map the fields? What mapping the fields means is like on the left it may say zip code and on the right it may say postal code. <laughs> so let's say in your Excel spreadsheet or whatever, it's, what it's doing is it's going to look at the top line to see your headings, like first name, last name, uh, phone number, zip, that sort of thing. If you happen to name them exactly the same as what Outlook is expecting, then the import will go smoothly. If not, you need to make sure you take that extra step of what's called mapping the fields, which all it says is if you call the field F name, then you need to say that in Outlook it's named first name. It's going to show you two columns and it's going to let you drag the one you called it over to the one that Outlook calls it. And usually Outlook does a really good job mapping by itself, but if it doesn't, you're going to want to check that. And what's so nice about importing into a second folder is if you screw it up, you can just delete everything in that second folder and do it again. And then once it looks perfect, then let's say this is the import folder you created, then you could just come in here, do a control A to select all, and just drag those into your contacts. And at that point, each time it hits something that it thinks is a duplicate, it'll say, do you want to update the contact or do you want to create a new contact? And I prefer that to do not allow duplicates because who's to say it really is a duplicate? You have two John Does. How do you know that, that that's a duplicate? I would much rather see them both on my screen, which this allows you to do, and then make choices. I realize we're at the end of our time, but is there any other thing that you wanted me to cover, um, Brian, before we sign off? Oh, this, this is great. Thank you so much for doing this again. I just want to remind people this is the beginning of our webinar series for the year. Um, we've got about 13 more webinars coming up, um, three more specifically with Sandy. Um, so please, uh, if you've got any feedback, take the survey that is in the chat box. There should be a link there. And we hope to see you at future webinars. Um, also, we will be looking into other systems if these continue to be as popular as they are so that we can support more people. Uh, current system supports up to 250, uh, but it looks like we could get over that later this year. So thank you guys so much. Also, just a quick plug, those of you um, see that there's a OneNote class coming up. Even if you don't know what OneNote is, come to the class. It will change your life. It is such a phenomenal program. Thanks for coming. Well, and, and it is free with um, Microsoft Office, so a lot of people have it and don't even realize it. Exactly. You already own it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.